She called me boring. I finish up my beer. I knew the expression in my beer was one of crying, but I wasn't. I didn't see any reason to cry. I felt bad without a doubt. But it wasn't like I had anything to mourn. A man does not need to mourn a woman who has left him. Why cry when you can simply replace her? Every day I hear women complain about a lack of good men. It's funny how often I hear that all the good ones are either taken or gay. Meanwhile, my male friends lament the scarcity of women who can keep their promises. Many men have suffered greatly as a result of divorce. There is something wrong there. I guess people don't realize how good they have it. It is wonderful to spend years with a partner and learn about all of your lover's likes and dislikes. No, I didn't complain about her wanting something or someone else. I lamented that she called me boring. I believe she made me boring just to dump me for it. That is misleading. She has not quite dumped me. She just informed me that she was going to date someone else because I was boring. When I was younger, I adored adventure. I kayaked with my friends around the islands, off the coast, and through whitewater streams in the mountains. I stopped taking day trips to the island and instead went for a nice long paddle to Long Island, which is 12 miles away. All I heard was that it was too far to go safely. Funny, I did it several times without issue. I like to camp on the beach of a state park and paddle back the next day. Karen saw this as unsuitable behavior for a husband and father. My family depended on me, and I shouldn't take unnecessary risks. Backcountry skiing, my motorcycle, and my little Triumph Spitfire were also no more. Scuba diving, mountain biking, and climbing. So being the good father that I am, I started skiing. Slopes are carefully groomed and not too steep. Mind you, I put my dirt bike in Triumph in storage. I traded in my soft-tail mountain bike for a road bike and joined a gym that has a climbing wall. I drove a minivan. Yes, a minivan with faux wood grain siding. Yeah, I understand. But I adored her, so screw you. She tamed my recreation, and then came the demands of my job. She didn't enjoy my travels. Most trips lasted a day or two to negotiate deals. Occasionally, I had to travel to London, Hong Kong, or wherever. I was skilled at negotiating deals that resulted in either a solid acquisition or a profitable sale for my company. She despised international trips, which usually lasted a few weeks. They always came with a nice bonus, so they were ideal for our financial situation. But she resented my absence when I was promoted to partner. Overnight travel has decreased dramatically. I could fly into most domestic destinations, complete the transaction, and return home on the red eye. However, it took me years to cut down on international trips. It was a catch-22, travel a lot, make lots of money, become a senior partner, train and manage negotiation teams to help you close deals, pass on the trip, allow someone else to make the trips and bring home the booty, watch as they move up the corporate ladder. No, nobody was going to pass me for any reason. I played it smartly. I was able to combine reasons to travel, so one trip could result in multiple compliments on my pursuit of partnership. I was the first in my company to use teleconferencing to do the groundwork. I made sure to charter small jets for my teams so that we could make the most of our time on the ground. It cost me a significant portion of my bonuses, but it was well worth it in the end. I climbed the ladder. Karen was happy and everyone was safe, but damn it, I was bored. I gave up everything to meet her priorities, and I'm boring, so screw her. I figured she should go find whatever excitement she was looking for. In the meantime... I'm going to return to the me that I so enjoy. Way back when, I had fun doing my thing. I defied gravity, flying off a muddy slope during a motocross weekend, the me who boarded a helicopter to find new powder on a backcountry slope that took all day to ski down. I returned to that same slope in the summer and climbed back up. She expected me to stay at home and wait for her. Remember the safety thing? I was supposed to be on call to help her if she got into trouble on her date. Seriously? 25 years of marriage after four years of friendship, dating, and schooling. I thought she was smart. Actually, she wasn't. I did not agree to this shit. I wasn't going to be there for her, either on call or waiting for her when she got home. Talk about boredom. All bets were off. All vows were canceled. Along with abandonment, all others went. Love, honor, cherish, and obey. She refused the last one. And now I understand why. Boring wouldn't matter if obedience was involved. So I came home from work, changed into jeans and a sports shirt, and was digging out my old boots when she emerged from the shower. She always liked my boots, whether they were riding or hiking boots, western boots, dress boots. It didn't matter. 
They all vanished when I transformed into Save Me. I should say, boring me. After all, I have been redefined. I knew I looked good in those boots, though. They fit better than ever. Everything did. I'd gained weight over the last 25 years, but it was all upper body muscle, so I knew those boots looked even better now that I had shoulders like a man's, a dab of aftershave, and a great sport coat. And there was no doubt that I was not going to wait for her. She wasn't happy. What are you doing tonight? Nothing is dressed like that. Who said boring couldn't include class? I was out of the door before she could respond. And on the way to my weekend, the minivan started right up with its powerful four-cylinder engine. Roared into life. Perhaps a herd for life. All right, I can't fool you. The minivan sputtered and knocked itself into gear. To its credit, it sputtered up the driveway and turned toward town before carrying could put something on. And I smirked as I saw her emerge from the front door in her robe. It wasn't long before my cell phone rang and went to voicemail. I had prepared a new message specifically for the occasion. Hello, this is Dale. I am unable to answer the phone tonight because I'm either driving or bored. If you need some excitement, call my wife Karen at 555-4269. She'll gladly talk about me. Otherwise, leave a message and I will get back to you as soon as possible. But don't be surprised if that doesn't happen soon. Perhaps Monday. Ciao. First stop. Get rid of this piece of crap. Van. I was tired of driving something with forward siding. I needed something rugged but elegant. I'd settle for real wood siding, even like a vintage Willis wagon. It would look great with a surfboard on top, right? I couldn't find a suitable combination for an old Willis Woody. I enjoy riding that, now that I'm free of the old, boring, spirit-killing ball and chain. It felt good to say so. Nothing that felt both elegant and rigged used to imply giving up. Boring me would have stashed the checkbook in the money market account where we used to save and gone home. No way was I going home. I purchased one of each. I bought two cars, one rugged and one elegant. The Mercedes dealer was happy to set me up with a nice convertible. Trace, elegant mass, Amos. Nothing is more elegant than a guy driving a Mercedes convertible and knowing what to say. Very elegant, my French-speaking friends. I realize I miss the accents, but I don't mind. I'm no longer boring, and looking them up would have meant waiting for it. You know what's coming. Boring. The dealer also had a great big-ass Jeep in his used car inventory, complete with mean-ass lifters, fat-ass knobby tires, bright-ass fog lights, and an awesome loud-ass train horn, among a dozen other aftermarket upgrades. I drove away in the Jeep, with the convertible delivered to my house and locked up in the driveway Sunday morning. Boring, she said. I was never one for boredom. She made me a terrible drag. Was history repressed back onto him the whole time? I went out looking for my first shot of adrenaline. I purchased a trailer and drove home, not to the house I shared with my spouse. Returned to Mom's house. I hadn't seen Mom in a few months. It was time. The three-hour drive was enjoyable because it allowed me to reacquaint myself with driving something powered by testosterone. Mom was ecstatic and had my favorite lasagna ready. She didn't ask why I was there or why Karen hadn't come to, but she could tell something was wrong. She could always read me. The next morning, I went out to the shed and pulled out my old Spitfire. I had kept it there all these years. My brother had driven it occasionally for me to keep it roadworthy. I wasn't as lucky with the dirt bike, but I didn't have to start loading it onto the trailer. By lunchtime, I had the bike in the car on my trailer rig, and Mom was smiling. So will you tell me about it? I smiled, too. What is this about? Mom? Twenty-five years of living your life the Karen way. You raised three children and buried my son in minivans and bunny slopes. Suddenly you arrive without your wife, driving a beast of a truck wanting your sports car and motorcycle and wearing those fine-looking boots. Like I said, Mom could read me like a book. I described Karen's recent battle with insanity. Maybe that girl is crazy, but you should thank her, honey. She set you free. Mom was correct. Mom was always correct. That evening I turned back on my phone. Karen and the children had been calling and texting all day. I put the kids in a text group and replied, Me? I am fine. I'm at Grandma's. Your mother and I disagree on something, so I decided I needed to think. So I went to see Allie. Dad, Mom is frantic. She says you vanished and she has no idea why. Me? I am not going to lie and I am not going to explain why. It is not my place to explain it to you. All I can say is that your mother decided I was boring, so I'm doing something about it. 
She can tell you what she's doing. Jenny, Daddy, that's not like Mommy. She always plays it safe. She would never threaten you or our family. You should return home and make things right. Me? Thank you for your faith in me before you crucified me for this minor incident. Why don't you get the truth from your mother? Daniel, Dad, we are not blaming anyone. We just want you to know that we love you both and wish you the best. Me? Thank you, son. Let me know when you've spoken with your mother. I had spent the night with my mother laughing at a cheesy old movie and was about to go to bed when my text alert went off. Jenny. I'm sorry, Dad. I cannot believe Mommy went out with another man. Me? I understand, sweetie. Jenny, what are you planning to do? Me. I'm going to live my life as usual. I'm not going to worry about your mother's living rules, because if they really mattered, she would have followed the marriage rules that we both agreed on. Not happening. Kids. She set me free. I can live the way I want to. Daniel. Hello, Dad. I get it. Kiss Grandma for me. And when I return home next weekend, I want to ride in the Spitfire. I laughed. Yeah. You guys read me as well as your grandmother, Ollie. You had better believe it. We also plan on taking a ski vacation during spring break, somewhere with a helicopter rather than a tea bar. What shall I say? My children knew what I used to do and what I really enjoyed. They saw pictures of me skiing and muddy from motocross and riding me. You bet. I'm thinking Banff. Get yourself in shape. Country trails are enjoyable, but they are also physically demanding. Boring, she said. Sunday morning, Mom and I went to our favorite bagel shop. I stayed and helped her with some household chores. At lunch, I used my phone to text, and I laughed at Karen's raging text. They delivered my Mercedes. They had locked the keys inside because I had spares. All she could do was stare at it as it blocked her car in the garage. I'd have to give the delivery team an extra tip for that. I went home. Karen's car was there. I backed the Jeep down my driveway, parked it, and got into my new Mercedes, chuckling as Karen tried to flag me down. She could now look at my new Jeep, which was hauling my Spitfire and Kawasaki, her two arch nemeses, food for thought. At least her side of the garage was clear so she could get out. Maybe she'll leave, right? It's too easy. Boring, she said. I didn't return home. I went to the mall to buy enough clothes for a few days, then checked into the Hyatt near my office. I took the penthouse suite. I didn't get all those bonuses over the years for nothing. I slept very soundly. The next day I went to work as usual and informed my team that I would be on the next trip, a trip to Hong Kong that included 160 acres of prime industrial land. Negotiations had stalled and now seemed like a good time to flex some boss man muscle. My team was thrilled. They had gathered three other potential acquisitions to look into while they were there. Why wait? I inquired when they showed me their preliminary studies on the sites. We are going to look but be prepared to be alert. Our council is over there. We are coming in hot and they must be prepared to crank out some serious paperwork for at least a month, people. If you can't do that, plan to tag team with Ian's group members. Feel free to fly your families over to see you at least once while you are away. I don't want any divorces because of this push. In fact, if you prefer, I will pay for their hotel, airfare, and other expenses for the duration of the trip. I will even pay for some sightseeing. I want you to be happy, hungry, and effective this month, boss, perhaps more. I intend to visit Sydney to learn more about the hotel group in Buenos Aires before we return. I'll send Ian to Seoul and Mumbai while we're in Hong Kong. People, this is a one-of-a-kind opportunity to make a lot of money. It's nice to see you back, Boss Carter Douglas. My heir apparent, the hot shit negotiator, grinned at me. I smiled back and grabbed my favorite numbers, fanatic at the elbow. Kim, please let me speak with you. I ushered her into my office and told my secretary to hold my calls, especially from my wife. She nodded, and I closed the door behind Kim and myself. Here's your big chance, Kim. We will be working quickly and with no margin for error. The majority of what we buy will be resold shortly after we return home, and each purchase or sale must go smoothly. And, in time, some of our acquisitions will be worthless. But we will be appealing to sellers who have items we want. So we'll unload some to get more. We will also be making stops to expand the markets for some of our product lines. Those will not be short-term deals, but will yield long-term profits that will open the eyes of the other partners, the people who will promote you from junior associate to something much more lucrative. This is your big moment. 
so I want you to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to back up any previous arguments or claims I make. Does that mean I smiled, Karen, and you're dating other guys? Does this mean I can sleep my way into a partnership? No. One woman betraying me at a time is simply too many. You will have to work your way up like everyone else. You know you want me. This was true. She was a living, wet dream, lean and alive, with legs that curved exactly where they should, beneath the lush palm, and those plunging necklines served as a constant reminder of how creamy and soft her delicious mangoes appeared. Indeed. But you work for me, so... No, not going to happen. On this trip, however, you would be right by my side and available for any business-related needs. You will pick me up in a limo on Friday morning. Dress as sexy as possible, even if I'm not. I want my wife to be worried that I will be sleeping with you when you arrive. Come to my door and get me. When you order the limo, specify Jane as the driver and inform her that she must wear the uniform with the short shorts. When I leave, I want my wife to be extremely jealous. My team was motivated. My wife was frantic to see me. My children were furious at my wife. Kim was horny, not for me, but to gain a promotion. Maybe for me, too, but I had already drawn that line in the sand. I went to the airport to book a flight. I thought about jumping out of one. Do not be silly. I wasn't going to kill myself if I wanted to be the thrill seeker I once was. I had to get up and get some adrenaline. It was awesome. I rented cameras for myself and my jump partner to capture the stunt. I posted it on Facebook and had a great night's sleep. The following day, my phone was full of missed calls and texts from the kids. Karen became enraged. The children screamed and refused to be served. The real me was back. Boring, she said. I did not want to see Karen, so I slept at home while she was at work and packed my belongings. I went to the airport and boarded a late flight to Chicago. There was no pressing reason to go but I had some prospects on the back burner that could be useful. It proved to be a profitable couple of days, keeping me out of Karen's reach until the big trip. I arrived late Thursday night and the house was dark. She finally arrived home at 2 a.m. I didn't even realize I was there. Luckily, she was alone. I would have had to confront her about bringing her toy boys into my home, but this way I could avoid seeing her until I was ready. I was also charged for it. I got up early, Packed my refreshed luggage, and by the door, I'd made myself a manly breakfast of steak and eggs while listening to ZZ Top on the stereo in the kitchen. I was dressed in a perfectly fitting pair of gabardine casual slacks and a new stylish sports shirt that Karen had never seen. Dressy comfort seemed ideal for the 18-hour journey to Asia, and I made them look good. Karen made her way down the stairs, drawn to the aroma of my coffee. I make excellent coffee, she sucked. Dale, you are home. Honey, why didn't you answer my calls? I've been worried sick. Yes, the kids informed me that you were worried. There's no need. I am fine. I'm simply doing as I please. Oh, you don't. Mister, I've got a better explanation than that. It's the perfect explanation. Last week you told me you were going to do whatever you wanted and I couldn't stop you. So I figured if wifey dear is going to do whatever she wants, I might as well do the same. If this is the new us, I can live with it. I never said you could do whatever you want. I said I was going out with other men. Okay, I understand. But I did not want that. So it follows. If you can make such a big decision against my wishes, there is no reason for me to consult you on mine. There is certainly a reason you have a family to care for. A husband and father have no reason to ride around on a motorcycle or race small sports cars. I thought we had settled that years ago. We did. But we've also gotten older and our circumstances have changed. Karen... I gave up all of those things for you and the children. I drove a minivan for crying out loud. I skied bunny slopes with my family. I hadn't jumped out of an airplane in years before this week. You called me boring. Shit. This is because I was bored. The kids have left. They have a large college fund to help them finish school. And here's a huge surprise. You and they are unaware of this. They each have a trust fund that will mature once they graduate from college. They have enough money to attend graduate school and make a down payment on a nice home wherever they live. Face it, the kids will be fine regardless of what happens to me or you. So, if the chute doesn't open and I die doing something amazing, I'll die smiling, and they'll be fine with me. You're aware that I am also invested in your future. You have a wife. Karen, I hate to break it to you, but... No, I do not think I do. 
What? Now just hold on, Dale, that's a significant leap. We've only just started looking into this. And you already think of me. I'm not thinking anything. I know I don't mean much to you anymore. If I did, you would not have given me that ultimatum. Do you think I'm boring? Okay, it's easy to give up. I've got some fun to have. I gave up a lot to be a family man. However, the family man isn't exciting enough to prevent his wife from sleeping on someone else's pillow. The doorbell rang just in time to save me from another shot in this ridiculous argument. Jen stepped in, with Kim right behind her. The two brought in four of the most impressive legs you've ever seen. Did I mention I looked great in gabardine? I looked even better with a tent inside my gabardine. Jen greeted me with a hug and kiss before beginning to move my four suitcases to the limo. Kim handed me a dossier and began rattling off numbers indicating where we stood in our negotiations. She rattled off the project names and locations that had Karen's full attention. Hong Kong. Sydney Wayne is an Aries. How long will you be gone? I expect a few months. There's plenty of time for you to explore before you get too old. Do me a favor, however. Do not let them into the house. Karen issued a series of appeals that would have made a public television telethon proud. She gave reason after reason. I needed to stay and we needed to discuss how our relationship had progressed and where we were headed. I stopped her there, honey. Wrong tense. Our relationship isn't working. It's gone. And right now, so am I. See you in a few weeks. I didn't catch a word of her rambling as we walked out to the car, but I did smile when she noticed my Jeep, Spitfire, and convertible parked in front of the garage doors. All three garage doors, including the one that houses her car, are lurking behind. Of course, what she said was to fall for me, even here. Hong Kong was fantastic. Kim was in the suite beside me, so she was available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but only in a professional manner, as we had agreed. She was great with numbers, and we were able to close all of the expected deals while also arranging for follow-up teams to return and close the rest in a month. We were also quite successful in Australia, and we reached an agreement in principle to purchase the entire hotel group again. A closing team would need to return in one month. We scouted for more acquisitions before returning to Argentina. I was able to reach an agreement with a motivated seller, and the team was able to add other projects to our corporate radar. All this time, I remained chaste and faithful to my marriage vows, hoping that hope will return home to find a desperate Karen who wants to reconcile. Bullshit. Karen may have gone insane, but I still adore the crazy woman. I wasn't ready to reject her, so I interpreted her ultimatum as a declaration of open marriage. There we remain married, but screw whoever we want. No problems. Carrie Moore was an old college friend who had become a professional buyer for wealthy tourists in Hong Kong. She spent the day taking my team around town, shopping at the famous markets. She directed me to a fine tailor before our 12-day stay in town was up. I left for Sydney with several new suits made to order, and we spent the night screwing each other up. It was exactly what I needed. A woman I trusted, a luxurious hotel suite in an exotic city, and unrestrained lust. I felt guilty for about ten minutes, which was the time it took me to remember. Karen wrote the rule book I was now using. Boring, she said. I realized I'd never been boring. I had, however, grown bored. Carrie was not boring, and the way her body quivered and shook when she climaxed indicated that she was not bored with me. When we left Hong Kong for Sydney, we hired a tour guide named Sydney. I enjoyed the sheer delight of touring the beautiful city during the day and the willowy, brown-haired beauty at night. I am not repeating myself when I say that I enjoy being in Sydney and Sydney. Rio was an equally target-rich business environment. We didn't do as well as we had in Asia or Australia, but we were able to justify another month abroad. Speaking of abroad, I met a hot Latin divorcee who taught me how to tango both upright and horizontally in bed. As we finalized our agreements, I sent my team back one by one on commercial flights. First class. A few days later, I boarded a leased jet, and the flight attendants welcomed me to the Mile High Club while also introducing me to the threesome's etiquette. I had a wonderful trip, but I wasn't finished yet. Boring. Okay, you get the picture before going home. I took my Rio tanned body skiing in Canada. I met my kids in Banff before Christmas. Why not? They finished their finals a week before their mother expected them home for the holidays. So there. The skiing was amazing, with steep drops on powdery slopes accessible only by helicopter. 
I spent my nights partying with my kids early and drilling the lights out of a voluptuous blonde housewife whom I met the first night in the bar when she told me her story of woe, of being traded in for a younger model by her husband and not knowing where to turn. I hired her. I gave her a generous housing allowance and offered to pay her moving expenses so she could become my new personal assistant. Of course, it wasn't until our third night sleeping together. Every night. She had screamed her climax in several languages, and when she went Russian on me with her sixth language in three nights, I realized that her translation abilities would be a valuable asset to our growing international interests. Of course, hiring her meant no longer sleeping together. My business ethics were not jeopardized when my cheating wife destroyed our marital ethics. Besides, the week in Banff was nearly over anyway. We flew home a few days before Christmas. The kids went home to see their mother. I checked into a hotel near my workplace. I hadn't planned to deal with Karen and jet lag at the same time. I did manage to buy a condo for myself as a Christmas present, and I spent Christmas with my wife and children. My cars were still parked out front of the garage. There was a small Cooper convertible parked in front of my Spitfire. I expected Karen to be angry, but she wasn't. She greeted me as if nothing had happened. Maybe I wasn't boring her anymore. I celebrated Christmas. I enjoyed her feast. I helped with the dishes and took the obligatory garbage to the garage. I brought the Mercedes and Spitfire into their base. Then I left in my Jeep. The telephone rang. I had hope we might both enjoy a Christmas truce. We did. You could stay for a few days for the kids' sake. I did. I slept in the guest room. The day after Christmas, I took each car to be washed separately, leaving them in the weather for four months. It may not have been the best decision for the cars, even if it served as a daily reminder to Karen that things had changed. I parked the Spitfire in the garage, intending to garage both the Jeep and the Mercedes at the condo. The second day after Christmas, Karen resumed hostilities. Her boyfriend came over for lunch. She smiled smugly. I went upstairs and grabbed my bag and returned to full-scale war. The kids were furious with Karen and she wasn't prepared for their fury. I guess she saw things going differently. It might have to accept that was Christmas. I stopped them to say goodbye. And they did. They said goodbye to Karen instead. We threw their bags in the Jeep and headed downtown. There was plenty to do in the city for New Year's, and we were going to have some fun. We did museums by day and clubs by night. Both kids had friends nearby, so all three of us got chances to hang together or break away. I also managed some alone time, which I didn't spend alone. By the time I went back to work, I had heard enough music, visited enough museums, eating enough fine food, and drunk plenty of fine wine and whiskey to last a lifetime. I settled into a routine that wasn't routine. My assault on the Southern Hemisphere that fall had given me new stature in the company, but it also garnered the attention of our competitors. I was actively courted by other companies who were impressed by our sudden flex of muscle. I didn't hide the fact from my team. In fact, I told them if I left, I was taking them along. Of course, word of what was brewing spread to the senior partners. I was called to the boss office. Karen's grandfather had started this company, and her father had expanded the business into a diversified giant that included a variety of manufacturing concerns. I had been hired when I married Karen and began as a low-level analyst, which fit perfectly with my educational background. I was given nothing special and even signed a prenup to prevent me from ever laying claim to Karen's eventual inheritance of the company, which was still almost completely owned by her dad. I got along fine with Mr. Adams, but we were not exceptionally friendly. He preferred to stay personally detached from his employees, even his son-in-law. I originally found it odd but as I rose through the ranks, realized how it allowed him to avoid favoritism and adopted the same stance. Hence, I refused to sleep with Kim or even play golf with my associates. Business is business, so I wasn't surprised when Adams cut right to the chase. Business is business. It seems a lot has changed for you in the last few months. You've done quite well at work, but seem to have lost a battle or two with my daughter. Do I have to worry about you? I leaned back into the plushness of the little chair in front of his desk. I knew the psychology of a short chair in front of the desk and a tall chair behind. Towering over an opponent is a dominant position. I guess they never saw those movies where the down swordsman thrust upwards into the exposed, soft underbelly of the dominant warrior as he winds up for the final lethal stroke. Yes, sir. You do. 
After 25 years with this firm, I'm still a lowly junior partner. I have brought in more business in the last five years than any other manager in my Asian Blitz. This last year was unparalleled. My earned bonus was accordingly higher than any other employee, including your divisional presidents. Yet here I am, junior partner. So I'm thinking of taking the standard severance and moving on. Dale, I can't promote you like anyone else. You're my son-in-law. How would that look? I understand business is business, but that cuts both ways. Business is business for me means taking an offer that reflects my ability. I can be a full partner tomorrow at Woodford Unlimited or Mark Manufacturing. I would expect some loyalty from my son-in-law, Slick. Business is business when you're keeping me down, but when it benefits you, suddenly loyalty is important. While we're on the topic of family loyalty, I wonder if you'd be willing to chat about what you did to teach that lesson to your daughter because you failed. Dale, I apologize. That's another thing. Why are you Mr. Adams while I'm Dale? Business is business. I deserve the same degree of respect that you expect. Very well, Mr. Carter. It is Dr. Carter. Remember, I defended my thesis for my PhD in economics last May. Very good. Dr. Carter, it is. I'm aware of my daughter's actions and am not pleased. We have spoken, to put it mildly, and, well, at the moment she is not speaking to me. My philosophy sucks. I broke in to finish this thought for him. Your philosophy on loyalty is totally out of sync with the rest of the world. Your business is business. Thing is just an easy way of dealing with a workforce that views you as a cold-hearted boss with the personality of a dead fish. Tell me, is it wise to keep your top producer down just because he is your son-in-law? I don't see much reason not to peddle my skills to another firm. Long story short, the arrogant son of a witch told me to go ahead and do my worst. I did. By close of business, everyone on my team, as well as Ian and his team, had tendered resignations. You never saw someone backpedal as fast in your life. Senior partnership for me, with a significant race, raises for both of our teams in the creation of a mergers and acquisitions division. Just for us. With my professional and financial future secured, I turned to my personal life. I rode my bike on wild trails and dirt tracks alike. I even raced motocross. I rode downhill on my mountain bike and got muddy. I looked good, muddy, and tired and played with a couple of biker chicks that thought it was hot. One was a Harley girl who liked my style on the motocross and thought I was pretty hot on the jumps for an old guy. Then, she told me to give her a call when I got something bigger than my dirt bike between my legs. I told her what's between my legs was going to need more than two wheels. As I loaded my bike onto the rig behind my beast cheap, she put the Harley on with my Kawasaki and we spent the night discussing the merits of nimbleness or raw power in our crotch rockets. Yes, we compared the bikes to between sweaty, sticky, moaning, groaning rocket maneuver events. I skied more than before I skied Tuckerman, and when the summer heat closed that venerable slope on Mount Washington, I found some excellent adrenaline cranking slopes and glaciers of the Pyrenees. It's funny seeing half-naked women basking in the sun at a high-altitude lodge right beside a snowy slope. It's even more fun watching them remove the rest of their clothing in your hotel room later on. I finished enough tandem jumps out of a perfectly good airplane to qualify to jump alone. So I did the same instructor gave me enough hours in a sailplane to solo. So I did. She was so excited having a student center earned both solos in the same month. She let me duo with her. We jumped naked and drilled on the deserted beach where we landed. We couldn't figure a way to do it in the sailplane since the seating was back to front and the seats were in the way of Hanky and Panky. So we jumped back to the beach again. It was hot the first time, so why not an encore? I posted everything on Facebook and my page was filled with comment activity from our friends and family, especially the kids who weren't speaking to their mom any more than I was. I wasn't at all. She tried to corner me, but you can't hit a moving target like you can a boring one. Boring me. Kiss my boring bum. After every post, my phone rang. I didn't block her number, I just didn't answer. She tried to catch me at work, even using her father to request my presence so we could talk. He didn't try that again after I threatened to defect to Woodford's if he ever tried that again. He had to restrain her in order to allow me a way to leave without her molesting me, some people's children. Then the full court press began. Aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers, sisters, pets, and grocery boys all seemed to be in favor of giving her another chance. Everyone makes mistakes, you see, so I put them into my shoes. 
I told the women to take their clothes off and lie down right where they were, then spread their legs and get ready for me to rock their world. After all, if mistakes like that were so easy to make, so lightly considered, and so easily forgiven, I should be able to make a few of my own, and might as well start with someone who understood the process so well. I told the men to bring me their wives, girlfriends, mothers, or of age daughters for the same reason. They were a bit shocked, but saw my point. I'm sure some would never speak to me again. That's not a bad thing. Still, I was getting sick of the dime store advice, and it was bringing me down. So I left. I took my team back on the road. They were thrilled as they had a ball on our first rampage, buying Asia and Argentina. This time, we hit Brazil and Argentina. Then we went back to Hong Kong. We did so well. We leased space and opened the first international office of the firm in Asia. Karen's dear daddy had nothing to object to, since we had made enough rain there to need a continued presence. So guess who was named as vice president for operations in the Southern Hemisphere? Yours truly. I installed Ian in Argentina and Kim in Australia, and our division's business took off. I never went home. Karen wanted to follow me, but the kids talked sense into her. I didn't want her and somehow she accepted that. I sent the Spitfire back to Mom's along with the bike. I gave my son the Jeep and my daughter the Mercedes. I gave Karen a divorce and Karen engagement ring. Yep, I had no intention of spending the best times of my life alone. I wanted a good woman by my side. Besides, she loves to skydive, so I got it all. Adrenaline, a happy home, a new start, my integrity and a shitload of money. Cause damn, it's there to be made in my new part of the world. If Karen had just come to me and said, I'm bored, let's find something new and exciting in our lives, I would have been thrilled. I was bored too. We could have skied together. It would have been a rush, teaching her and taking her along. We could have traveled. We could have rafted rivers safely or ziplined through Cambodia with little risk and plenty of rush. I would have done anything for her until she threw me over for someone else. I couldn't stomach that. I hear she is intensely unhappy with the dating scene. She finds the guys available lacking. She is jealous of the fact her dad loves the shit out of me for moving away from her because we are making his company obscene amounts of money. She regrets what she did, but no, she can't go back. Carrie makes sure of that. Everything. She gets in a helicopter with ski boots on or straps on a parachute, but my ultimate adrenaline rush is going to bed with her every night. There isn't anything Carrie won't do in bed and there isn't anything she hasn't enjoyed that I've done with her. I know because once we have done it, she wants it again. That never happened with Karen, even when we were young and things were good. But we have never spoken since that day. Her dad had to restrain her so I could leave and assaulted. I'm sure she would like to talk, but she knows how little I want to do with her one day. I suppose one of the kids will get married or have a grandchild that I will be eager to go meet. Karen will surely be there, and I will finally have to interact. But I'm not worried. When that time comes, my Carrie will be there by my side. No, she won't have to protect me. She'll be there to make sure I'm not too boring or bored.